Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this 11th hour racing lunchtime webinar on microfiber pollution and the core of all. My name is Alessandra Ghezzi and I manage communications for 11th hour racing. For those of you who are not familiar with 11th hour racing, we are a program of the Schmidt Family Foundation. We are based in Newport, Rhode Island and we use the platform of sailing to increase our understanding of ocean health issues find innovative solutions to these issues, and promote stewardship and sustainable use of the sea. Since 2010, we have been collaborating with the international sailing community through three main areas of engagement, grants, partnerships, and ambassadors. We are excited to be joined today by one of our grantees, Rachel Miller, Executive Director and Founder of Rosalia Project for a Clean Ocean. Rachel will be giving us an overview about microfiber pollution and telling us more about her innovative solution, the Cora Ball. Um, before we start, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions, uh, Rachel will provide her email address at the end of the presentation. Uh, so please um, email Rachel directly for questions. And with that, I will turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, 11th Hour. Just like the title says, we are eating our fleece. Our clothes are breaking up into tiny, tiny little pieces, and those pieces are flowing out our washing machines into our public waterways. Here's a magnification, a magnified image of just a pinch of some of those fibers that were flowing out of my own washing machine during a test load. Now, before we go into that, I want to just give you a little bit of information about Rosalia Project. All of what I'm about to talk to you, all of what I'm about to talk to you uh, about has come from the work of our nonprofit, our ocean protecting nonprofit. Our mission is to clean and protect the ocean and conserve a healthy, thriving marine ecosystem. And what sets us apart from other marine debris organizations are a few of the strategies and techniques and values that we hold as we work on this can feel overwhelming problem. So the first is that we work on marine debris from multiple angles, cleanup, education, embracing innovation and technology, and, do and doing solutions-based research. We address the whole water column from surface to sea floor. So that means the shoreline, but also we use nets and boat hooks to address the surface and an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle we call Hector the Collector to not just see what's on the seafloor but clean it up as well. From the start we very deliberately worked on urban and coastal waters as our focus. That is where the majority of ocean trash comes from and we believe that is the most cost-efficient and effective place where we should be looking for solutions. We thrive on great partnerships like the one we have with 11th Hour Racing and other organizations, for example, U.S. Sailing as part of their REACH program, a STEM curriculum with the Ocean Conservancy as the Vermont, head, the Vermont coordinators for the International Coastal Cleanup, among other projects, and companies like Surf Suites, Organic Candy, who've supported our work at a variety of levels from on the water to hooking us up with a really great 3D printer. Finally, we remain optimistic in the face of this overwhelming problem because we acknowledge that the collective human we made the problem of marine debris and we are confident that the collective human we can fix it. Rosalia Project is headquartered in Vermont, but we operate during the summers from a 60-foot sailing oceanographic research vessel between New York and Bar Harbor has been our operating area, really primarily the Gulf of Maine in the summers. This is a pretty cool boat. This is uh, Dodge Morgan, the guy who built her. He broke the solo nonstop circumnavigation record on American Promise. And we are doing our best with help from partners like 11th Hour Racing to keep her out front. She's the greenest oceanographic sailing oceanographic research vessel and that happened that is the case because we installed solar wind and hydro a couple years ago 
and that has provided 100% of our house bank power uh, in, in the last three years. So we haven't turned our generator on, which is pretty exciting. And we'd be happy to talk to you about other ways that we keep American Promise low footprint. But for this webinar, I want to get back to those fibers. The mechanism for the problem primarily are our washing machines. This is our land sea interface of our homes, really any drain is. So that's one part of it. The other part is how our clothing is made. Now we have spectacular technical clothing that allows us to do sports and withstand cold and heat without wearing a lot of weight. It's spectacularly smart. But when you really look at it under a microscope, you see its vulnerabilities. So here's my favorite fleece, or sorry, my favorite thermal. And that's what my favorite thermal looks like magnified. So just one thread that we would see with the naked eye, which is kind of represents pretty much everything you see in this picture, is really made up of thousands and thousands of tiny fibers. Here's a pair of jeans and jeans magnified. These jeans are made up of a combination of ocean, recovered ocean plastic and cotton. And here's a fleece dress. We wear those in Vermont. And here's my favorite fleece dress magnified. So you can see how vulnerable this technical clothing is to breaking. And it's not just our technical clothing, but all of our clothing. The magnitude of the problem is being researched. And there's more and more information coming out. The Bren School of Oceanography, along with Patagonia, did one study looking at fleece and found that one fleece jacket could put as many as an average, this is an average, of over 81,000 individual microfiber pieces out with the effluent water per garment per wash. And another study determined that just one polyester shirt could put up to 700,000 individual pieces of microfiber out the effluent with the effluent water, and that is per garment per wash. There's nothing to stop this pollution. Individually, these pieces are tiny, tiny, too small for the eye to see, and even in bundles that are very small. The only filters that we have on our washing machines right now look like this. This is from a front loader, and clearly this was designed to protect your pipes from coins and business cards and things like that that you leave in your pockets. So without something to stop these fibers, they are washing out the effluent with the effluent water into one of two places, either wastewater treatment plants or into our septic systems and leach fields. If they go into the septic, or if they go into the wastewater treatment system, what we're looking at is a system that wasn't built to stop things so microscopic, or at least not these particular fibers. And so what seems to be happening is that they are washing straight through our wastewater treatment plants, so heading right for the nearest river, lake, or bay, or they're getting hung up in the sludge. And many wastewater treatment uses their sludge or turns their sludge into agricultural product, which gets spread onto fields. If someone has a septic system leach field, like a lot of us here in Vermont do, then the fibers are either going straight out into essentially the water table, into the groundwater, or they're getting hung up in the sludge, which gets cleaned every three to five years and ending up in the same place. The consequence of this pollution, first to our marine food web, has two components. The first is a physical component of fibers tangling up and filling the bellies of especially the smallest of creatures like plankton with something that is simply not giving them any nutrition. And so a creature whose belly is full of fiber that's not doing anything for them could starve to death essentially because there's not enough room for their food that would give them nutrition and nutrients. The other problems have to do with the chemical components of our textiles. And sometimes that's the textile itself such as textiles made of synthetic fibers, different plastics, the relationship that plastics have to persistent organic pollutants that are in our waters like PCBs and DDT that has been shown to adsorb onto marine borne plastic. There's still work being done to understand the full consequence of that, but we know there is a transfer of 
these persistent organic pollutants into the tissue of sea creatures who eat marine borne plastic. And then our naturally derived fibers like cottons, those are not off the hook because those are still often covered in a variety of heavy metals related to dye setting, dyes themselves, and other chemicals. So these are all entering the marine food web through ingestion. And think of it as this way, whatever they eat, we eat. So these chemicals are ending up on our plate. And for Rosalia Project, when we learned about this problem, this relatively newly discovered problem, it was discovered around six years ago, we just thought we had to do something about it. This was a problem that really screamed at us. Other research really tracks it right to our plates. Chelsea Rockman and her team did a study where they purchased fish from a fish market in California and found that one in three shellfish, one in four finfish, and 67% of all the species had microplastic, mostly microfiber in them. And so if we weren't already convinced, that did it for us. And we realized we were going to be part of the solution somehow. And so we started working on it. And so now I get to introduce you to the Cora Ball. If this was live, I would show you the Cora Ball and pass it around the room. But you'll have to go with pictures for this. The Cora Ball is the world's first microfiber catching laundry ball. And it can be used in any washing machine by just dropping or throwing it in. The Cora Ball was inspired by coral. And uh, we're using a process of biomimicry. When we started to look at the problem, we realized pretty quickly that a standard filter or sieve simply wasn't going to work. We had to do two things, and this is what a piece of mesh can't do. The first was that we had to let water flow. And this problem is one of very, very small items. So the holes of the mesh needed to be big enough to let water flow while achieving the second goal which is catching small things from that flowing water. We simply couldn't achieve that with just a piece of screen or mesh or some filter that existed already. So we thought, who does that? And realized coral does that. Coral is essentially stuck to a rock. It lets water flow, and it picks small things from that flowing water. The way the coral ball works is that you just chuck it in your washing machine, and you can see it. It's just swooshing around along with your clothes. It's not batting against them or anything like that. It's just kind of staying with them. But a lot of the water in your wash is passing by. And the water in your wash has those microfibers in it. So the stalks of the coral ball are able to catch microfibers that are suspended in the water. Here is what it looks like after a pretty big dog towel load. We did not uh, design this in, but it catches hair. I don't know if any of you have seen any videos from Rosalia Project or a picture of me. I have a lot of hair. And I have two beloved Newfoundlands who have a lot of hair. And so we found that it's a bonus that the Cora Ball is catching tons of people hair and a whole lot of pet hair as well. And not only that, but it's helping to aggregate the fibers. Sometimes you catch just a medium amount. This is after three, three washes. Sometimes you catch a lot more. Here's three washes with a little bit more of the dog blanket and a little bit more hair. And we designed the Cora Ball so that it was really compatible with everybody's lives. We didn't want it to be a hardship. And so every now and then, but not every time, you will realize that there are some fuzz balls in your Cora Ball that can be pulled out. And so you clean it like you clean a hairbrush. You just pull the fuzz balls out and throw them away for now, just like you'd throw away your dryer lint. I've been talking about this problem as one of microscopic pieces. And so it's important that our solution can catch those little pieces too. Here is from one of our tests. And I'm going to show you a video of just how it is working to pick up these tiny little pieces, ones that we can't see alone. Essentially what it's doing is it's tangling them up into, for lack of a better way to say it, into fuzz balls. So we've got our, our little microscope here attached to the computer and took a fuzz ball out of a test Cora. And you can see right there, that's mostly fiber with some big strands of hair. 
when you see the still, the hair is the piece on the right, big, thick, brown piece of hair, <laughs> and then lots of tiny little fibers tangled up into a fuzzball. Here's what it looks like in real life, just so you can see the scale. And this gives us the confidence that we are catching these tiny fibers as well as the longer ones. Now, to underscore the need for this product and the need for a solution and to bring people's attention to the problem, as well as to learn more about the problem itself to strengthen our own solution, last year we went and sampled the whole Hudson River looking for microfiber pollution. The Hudson is a pretty awesome study river for this because it's a little over 300 miles long, which makes it fairly accessible. We were able to access the river approximately every three miles, and it goes from very alpine and very remote to New York City and Manhattan, where there are lots and lots of people. We teamed up with adventure scientists and Abby Barrows for a process that made sure that it reduced contamination and was compatible with other data sets in the world. So that meant using a metal bucket to collect water samples, wash our jars and our forearms three times each before actually collecting the liter water sample, taking refractometer readings to understand salinity, and then bringing them into a clean boat with clean lab coats to do some vacuum filtration. So we sucked all the water through a less than one micron filter paper, and then we cleaned the area we would normally use to eat on the boat and turned it into our lab, where Abby from Adventure Scientist did the microfiber counting, and another one of our scientific partners, Andy Watts from the University of Exeter, helped us determine what pieces were that we didn't recognize with his cool FTIR, sort of a laser machine. So we were able to identify pieces, exactly what kind of plastic they were, or to confirm that they were natural. Here is a microfiber from the wild. So that little blue one, just to the left of the black uh, yard, uh, the black measuring tool, is one of the microfibers we found. Here are a few more. These are all from the Hudson River samples. Now, we are going to share our Hudson River data with you in the fall. We can't wait to do that, but I can tell you a few things. One is we learned how difficult this science is because of contamination. What we're looking at here are fibers not from the wild, but fibers from one of our lab blanks. So that means water from a faucet. We don't know if these fibers got into our sample through the faucet or through the air, but it really underscores how ubiquitous the fibers are. One thing I can share with you as far as results from our paper goes, or from our study goes now, is that we expected a perfect heat map as far as starting really cool, which means no fibers up in the mountains, and increasing, increasing, increasing as we got to New York. But what we found was uh, a lack of any statistically significant spikes. Essentially, we found a similar concentration up in the Alpine region that we did in the Manhattan full-on urban areas. And so when we got that data, it really occurred to us that wastewater treatment plants are not the only source, that also septic system and, and leach fields are, but also potential airborne contamination is a factor here. So whether that's from abrasion and use or something like this, as soon as I got that data, I ran out to behind the house and checked out what it looked like outside of our dryer exhaust vent. And this is what it looked like. And it had rained three days ago. So I will admit we uh, wrote our patent for the Coraball to expand the dryers as well because it's clear that washing machines are not the only source. Now, speaking of solutions and different opportunities for innovations to help stop this problem, I want to wrap up this webinar, hopefully, with some inspiration for people. And those of you listening might be involved in some of these industries and can think about ways to be part of the solution. So the first way I want to think about this, or when we think about it, is how can we place this in the format of a, of a circular economy? And the way to think about the circular economy is three ways. 
So to prevent leakage, in this case, leakage are these little tiny fibers breaking off our clothes and ending up in the ocean or any of our public waterways. So to prevent leakage, there are opportunities to keep our clothing from falling apart. The second is to stop the leakage. And that's what we're doing with the Coraball and any other innovations that are related to being a barrier in the effluent or of the effluent to not let this stuff get to either our wastewater treatment or to our public waterways. And the last one is to close the loop. And that means there's an opportunity for us to find partners, and this is something we're really interested in doing and motivated to do, is to find partners with whom we can work to upcycle or recycle our laundry lint. Now that we can catch lint from the washer, we know we can already catch lint from the dryer, we have the opportunity to get a lot of this material back and put it back into the world as ideally some kind of high value and durable good. Now within opportunities for innovation in a specific way, we can look at four different industries. And the first is the textile industry. So isolating out the synthetic side of things, we can look at four elements of the textile industry. First are the people that mix up plastic in the first place. Maybe there's a way to do it so it ultimately strengthens the fiber. Then you have extruders. These are the people that take resin pellets and stretch them out to make a filament. And maybe that could be done faster or slower or hotter or cooler. Or there's some level there that can have something that can happen that strengthens those fibers. The next are the weavers who take the filaments and make them into a fabric. And perhaps there's an opportunity there to strengthen those individual fibers within the fabric. And finally, clothing designers. As we learn more about this problem and more research is published, there are decisions that clothing designers can make that will help. For example, a paper has come out recently that determined that acrylic fabric sheds more than polyester, and polyester sheds more than a cotton poly blend. And so right there is an opportunity for clothing designers to make choices that at least slow the entry of fibers into our public waterways. The second category or industry has to do with consumers. And of course, that's where the core of all, that's where we've started. And the next is the laundry industry on the whole. So we talked about washing. We talked about dryers as being a potential input. And then detergents are also an opportunity for innovation because there are enzymes in detergents that could either promote the breaking off of fibers, which if we have a great mitigation system might be something that you do every now and then, or inhibit the breaking of fibers. So there's some great opportunity within the laundry industry. And finally, in the wastewater treatment industries, both for wastewater treatment plants and septic systems, we have also written our patent to use our technology in municipal wastewater treatment or septic systems themselves to help, again, allow water to flow and to catch those small fibers. So we see a lot of opportunity out there, and we believe that there's not going to be one of those groups who solves this problem, but it's going to be something that we all do together. We have some exciting things coming up to help us understand how effective the Cora Ball is or how it can be and to make sure that we understand best practices. So on Friday, September 1st, a small team of Rosalia Project, two of us on the Cora Ball Inventor team, uh, we are heading to, from the yellow star in Vermont, to the red one in the Arctic Circle, to Svalbard, uh, an island archipelago well north of Norway, but it's a Norwegian area, to work with people from the University of Tromso, who determined that this settlement, this city there, the only one, whose 500 households all empty into the same wastewater treatment plant does have a lot of microfiber flowing out. And they wanted to see if our solution could at the community and at the municipal level make a difference. So we're heading out there to distribute the core balls and to educate the citizens about the problem. Then the researchers after we leave are gonna come back and 
take the samples. They've already done a baseline. So we can see what the potential impact is, or actually not potential, but what the real impact is at the municipal level for everyone to use a Coral Ball. The Coral Ball is a solution that relies on what I call lots of littles making a big. So lots of little efforts adding up to big impact. Lots of little fibers adding up to a whole lot of man-made stuff that we don't need in our ocean. In our own in-house testing, we determined that if 10% of US households with a washing machine used a Cora ball, we can keep the plastic equivalent of over 30 million water bottles out of our public waterways per year. That's a lot of littles making a big. I really appreciate 11th Hour hosting this webinar and supporting our work to protect the ocean. I look forward to questions and invite you to send your questions to me at rachel at rosaliaproject.org. I'm really easy to find, so send your questions. You can also learn more about Rosalia Project, as well as opportunities to join us as a guest scientist, guest educator, guest marine debris person, guest ocean lover on American Promise for next year's expeditions, and read more about the Cora Ball on our websites, and of course, we're on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you again, 11th Hour, and we hope you all enjoyed this lunchtime webinar. Thank you, Rachel, for your very exciting and in-depth presentation. We actually did receive a couple of questions, um, so I will have to turn the voice again to you. But So the first question is, what do you think will be the biggest challenge in ultimately ending microfiber pollution? That is a good question. I think the biggest challenge will be in understanding that all of those four industries that I talked about have a role to play and that no one group is going to solve it for everyone. So we have heard a fair amount from the clothing industry and that is extremely inspiring. Uh, groups like Patagonia and Columbia and North Face and Organizations that are part of the Outdoor Industry Association have made a task force to address this. And that's great. Now, I personally haven't heard a lot from the, for example, washing machine industry. And so I think right there demonstrates a potential challenge. I don't know what the washing machine industry is thinking. Hopefully it's not that the clothing people need to deal with this. Hopefully we can get everyone across a wide variety of parts of this problem to do part and ultimately come up with the best suite of solutions possible. And do you think that policy change and leg legislation is needed to address this issue? For example, the microbe, the microbe uh, ban, something along those lines, would that make a difference? For sure, the microbead ban, in our opinion, was the right way to go. We have the highest respect for the groups that spearheaded that and made that happen, and we supported that fully. That microbead, the microbead problem was ultimately less complex than this one because there was an alternative, and it was pretty though difficult, and I don't want to belittle the hard work that went on to make that happen. That was spectacular, but it was pretty straightforward. There was a thing, it was made of a forever material going down our drains. We have natural alternatives, they should be used, period. The situation with our clothing is so complex. I don't think we can feed and clothe the world on our agriculture. And if that's the case, then that means that synthetic clothing has a place in our lives and in our world. It just needs to be done better. It needs to be done in a way that it doesn't have this sort of open leakage or this stream of pollutants coming off of it. I, my favorite temperature, personal favorite temperature is 22 Fahrenheit. People think I'm nuts. But one of the reasons I love winter is because I have the perfect clothing for it. I am not wearing animal hides. I or like a moose. I'm from Vermont. I'm wearing light, breathable, spectacularly technical gear. Now, I don't want that gear to fall apart and pollute the ocean that I love so much and that we all need for life. So that's 
why I don't think bands on synthetic clothing in any kind of a blanket way are going to work. This is one place where a call for more research is relevant to say we really need to understand why this is happening and what it is that causes it. If we can get to the root of that, maybe we could place a hierarchy on fabrics so people understand some are much better than others and we can slow the, slow the flow just for that. But uh, this one is going to be complex and sort of goes back to my answer of the question before, it's going to be one that has to be solved in a multitude of ways. The place I do see a potential for regulation is if we can find a mitigation method, whether that's a coating on fabrics that is non-toxic in and of itself, but also keeps fabrics from falling apart, or solutions like the Cora Ball, or some other kind of filter that are incentivized or as from a regulatory sense or eventually required, I could see that kind of regulation playing a role. And just the last question, um, tagging on to what you just explained, what do you think individuals can do besides obviously purchasing a beautiful car ball? Is there anything else that you could suggest? Yes, thanks to some research that's coming out there, we have a sort of list of action items. So the first is, we didn't even need research for this, but wash less, so spot clean when you can. I think more and more people are realizing that fleeces and jeans and things like that don't necessarily need to be washed every time that you wear them, although we definitely say wash them when they're gross. Uh, so that's the first, wash less, wash gently. So the settings on your washing machine will play a role in how much fiber is breaking off your clothes. And this is also good for the longevity of your clothes, not just good for the nearest body of water. So uh, gentle cycles are better. Also washing in cool or cold water as opposed to hot is better. Research has also indicated that when the opportunity presents itself, buying up market or we'll say better made, not the fast fashion so much. So a $5 fleece is likely to shed more and shed faster than a more expensive fleece. We understand that not everyone can buy expensive clothing, but it's something to think about. Uh, it'll last longer and, and maybe owning one or two good pieces rather than five not so good ones uh, strategically can work out for longevity and ultimately work out for finances. And then the last is that we don't want people to throw their washing machines away, but when it's time, like that still work, but when it's time to replace a washing machine, evidence suggests that front loaders uh, had caused less shedding than especially the top loaders with a spindle because they use less water and are a little gentler. So those are some of the ways, if, in addition to of course using a core ball, that, uh, that everyone, no matter what kind of washing machine or what they're doing, the actions that people can take to uh, slow the flow of microfibers into our public waterways. Well, thank you, Rachel. That was great feedback and insight. So thank you again for your wonderful presentation. Thank you to all of you who viewed this webinar. Please feel free to share it with others who might be interested. Thank you again and have a great day.